Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I'm leaning right next to Shep Moss sitting on a cooler. And I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left. And we're back. So guess who we got here? Who we got? Let's have the second podcast. This is podcast versus podcast. Guys? I am Billy with the Appalachian Podcast, and I'm not joined today by my lovable, goofy, tall co-host, because he's back home dealing with his Tesla. Mm. And I'm joined here today by Scott, who has never done anything like this in his entire life. And he's been thrust I right into the I remember the, the Tesla guy now from Motor Mile last year. Yeah. 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 Old Tesla guy. Yeah. Scott looks petrified. <laughs> He'll lose. I don't enough. talk much. So. It's got a big been... black thing. It won't bite you. Go <laughs> ahead. You'll be all right. Scott has been on a couple of our shows before, and he kind of sits in the corner and will comment here and there if he gets excited. I don't have a lot of expectations of him today, but uh, as long as he's here and he rode down the road with me, I appreciate that. So, so he's stunt Bodine, basically. Basically, so basically. What we're trying to do today is we're trying to kind of join two podcasts together. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, uh, we started our podcast after we appeared on our first podcast, which was the Appalachian podcast, right? with you and me at Motor Mile a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it was inspirational. It was a lot of fun. We sat out there outside the track and interviewed uh, Bobby Labonte and Chris Williams and Burt Myers, and we had a great time. And you and Bobby had a, a wonderful conversation, Hermie. And, and after that, uh, you know, some opportunities came along, and we started our podcast. But we always pay homage to the guys that had us on their podcast first. And now we're sitting across from in uh, Hermie. I Hermie's still coach. got my Appalachian podcast T-shirt that I wear regularly. Excellent. I appreciate that. And I can only imagine... After that podcast we did in turn three of Motor Mile, the conversation was something along the lines of, uh, hey, Hermie, that was a lot of fun right there. We should start our own podcast. If these mouth-breathing slack jaws can do it, of course we can do something <laughs> like that. And when you call us, I sincerely appreciate you calling us an inspiration. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's very flattering. I must remind you I'm not in your voting district, though, so uh, you don't oh, have I to. Oh, I take be. it all back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, it's, uh, cut the tape, Chad. We're done. <laughs> no, no. Now, listen, uh, we love what you do. I listen to you guys all the time. Everybody who's listens to our podcast should listen to you guys because it really – captures the flavor and the and the culture of our area that we live in in south side in southwest virginia uh and in the same way um we hope your listeners will listen to us because we talk about politics that matter to south side and southwest virginia and racing and that's our commonality we talk about auto racing and how important it is to our rural areas and, and that's where we got our start together in our relationship and i think that's why we're coming together in this kind of unique way of having podcast v podcast what uh what kind of propelled you guys to start a podcast in the in the beginning um well during the whole covid stuff uh we we of course mo- most of y'all will remember and i don't want to get too political about this being next to a politician but we had a lot of you know the whole statue movements across the across the state and people want to tear down statues and things like that and um i don't know it seemed like they were bringing a lot of unneeded attention <laughs> to that during a time period when I figured they could focus their attention on something more pressing, like being locked in your homes and being forced to wear masks to just associate in public and things like that. And the New York Times and the Washington Post came into Franklin County and wrote some some awful horrible hit pieces, essentially, to make us seem like we were just, you know, a bunch of yokels who have been racist since uh, 18. And that's completely untrue. And I decided, I said, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to fight these lunatics, uh, Toe to toe because they're just they, they don't fight the same way. So what I got to do is get out there and let people know that our culture, our Appalachian culture, whether it be racing or bootlegging or music or food, it's fun and it's exciting. And you got to win the culture war by changing the culture. And so, quite frankly, we never look at each other in any different way. We're just who we are. We wave at each other when we pass each other on the street. Uh, if you're mowing your lawn and you're John Deere tractor, we wave at you there. And if you don't, then you find them at the minute mark and they go, "Hey man, we got a problem." You didn't wave at me when you drove by my house while I was cutting my lawn. I mean, that's the life that they don't have, and they want the trees. They want the nature. They want everything we have, and now they want to take away our farms and put solar farms on them. And they, you know, in in the Virginia legislature, I'm going to tell you, and Hermes heard this before, my dad was in the military, so I grew up in northern Virginia, Virginia Beach. My family's from southside Virginia, and let me tell you, those those a-holes, more often than not, Look at us, it looks, look down on us like we're backwards. And they like to say, you know, almost as my dad used to lovingly say, when I want your opinion, I will give it to you. They have no idea what this place is. We built Virginia. We've got some of the finest people, no matter what their ethnicity, color, creed, 
nationality, whatever. This is what they want. This is a utopia that they can't have, and they look down on us for it. They hate us because they ain't us. It's a, good, it's a good little thing there, Shep, isn't it? Yeah. How, how close are you to Floyd County? We border Floyd County. So. so did you just go to Floyd Fest? No, we didn't make it up there. I've got a three-month-old at home, and my wife is literally holding my mail parts hostage. And the fact I was able to come back down here today after last night was nothing. I had to woo her with Senator Stanley's... Um, we know all about somebody <laughs> yeah, holding yeah, the man. Raise your hand yeah, in the mail park. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk now about look, that on a future look, yeah, episode. Floyd, a story. Floyd Fest is actually not in Floyd County. It's in Patrick County. No, it's still in Floyd County. Yeah. It's right along. It's by the um, the winery up there, I'm pretty we, sure. We say it's still Patrick County. This is disputed territory. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that's understandable. So what, uh, as we're taping this, we're at North Wilkesboro Speedway. We came back to the reopening of an historic racetrack and... So what brings you guys here? Uh, well, Chris Williams, honestly. Um, Jesus, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. <laughs> sorry, Chris. Uh, the bar high. <laughs> you know, when we started this podcast a year and a half ago, my whole initial thought was, I'm going to have to beg just some local business owners and people here and there, just come on the show and tell their story, because it's not something that a lot of people are comfortable with. And a year and a half into it, I'm sitting here next to somebody who used to watch racing as a kid, and, uh, you know, a state politician, I've got to sit down with Bobby Labonte and a handful of other folks. And I never imagined that it would kind of, that it would get to this point as fast as it did. So we had Satchwarley on last fall, and that episode just blew up. I've never expected it to do as well. And the very next week we had Chris, and ever since then, you know, we just, Chris gave us his time, so we try and support him and promote this tour as much as we can. And I found no reason not to continue doing so because he's done nothing but put on show after show. And when I found out they were coming back here after all the hard work people have put into this and a lot of the hard work you all have put into it, I know this isn't a Virginia uh, uh, historical track, but it's we're, we're fighting the same battles here. And to have, and to have North Wilkesboro come back, that's a huge, huge thing for other small venues. So we felt, we felt obligated to come down here and, and let everybody know just what they have been able to do with this. We've place. got a racetrack in Virginia, many. But one of the ones that we're trying to shine a little bit of a light on is the legendary Southside Speedway uh, just outside of Richmond uh, up in Virginia. And the same template, the same things that, you know, on a different scale perhaps that have happened here, we need to happen up at Southside Speedway. So what did you uh, think here this week when you saw a, a, a packed house awesome. roar with the approval as they dropped the green flag on a, a modified race here at North Wilkesboro? My mind was absolutely blown. You know, we, we did a podcast on Monday night with Steve Post really hyping all this kind of stuff up. It was a different. It's not Steve the Steve Post of MRN yes. Radio fame. Yeah, it's not the Appalachian podcast. Got yeah, some of the best hair in, in America. Man, hippie well, hair. Hey, come That's on now. Yeah. Come on, gentlemen. You're no disrespect to Senator. <laughs> you got, you got a little perm going on, but... You mean Q-tip? Yeah, how about this Q-tip thing over here? Man. The proof is in the poof. Right. You know how you used to walk around with those combs in your back pocket that I would stick one. up from the 80s? So he still got one. Exactly. You're still using the same, the I original might, comb? I might have one in my drawer, okay? But I'm never letting you yeah, find back out. back pocket. They're called a pick comb, right? I think that's what they're called. Pick. It's a pick, yeah, pick. it's a pick. In the 80s, it was a pick. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I purple? Well, you know, in the 70s, when people's hair grew long like yours, mine grew out. So I just looked like, and I, that's how I earned the name Q-Tip, because it looked like a damn... Speaking of uh, 70s hair, have you got any thoughts on our newest sponsor on our podcast, Manscaped? I don't know what Manscaped is. I've heard them on quite a few other um, shows, but is that something that has to do with uh, maybe scaping parts of your body? You're, you're still scared? rocking the 70s up top and down below? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Might be a reason why your wife is... <laughs> the carpet matches a drape. Disenchanted yeah. with you right now. Link. That's exactly what they would Would you we'll, we'll send you a kit just to see? Oh my god. What's your promo code again? Oh. Sadler. I'm so sorry. Thank y'all. You're good. Um I'm ready to go again. Oh, we're already going. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we never stopped. <laughs> Carpets and drapes, uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Not on a man. Maybe that's a little personal for us Well, it's just a, it was just a me trying to get a sponsor plug in that you always tell me how important. Yeah. It is, but then you won't read this. If you decide to buy his wife will not kit, let him read the use promo code Sadler. Well, I was okay. Well, for one, my wife will be listening to that, and she will. Number two, I was was listening to you. All I recommend you. the ball toner, by the way. <laughs> Highly. Speaking of sponsors, Hermie, you want to read your sponsors? No, not this is inappropriate. 
Chip. Chip. And you're skating on thin ice. <laughs> Chip. Well, I was hoping Man, the uh, I was hoping the uh, the the turning left uh, segment still need a sponsor for ten dollars a roll. I figure me and Scott could probably throw it fifty and get about five spots oh, in yeah, there. No, yeah, uh, yeah, it's it goes very cheap on that side of the old deal. <laughs> hey, that's fine by me. Hey, yeah. Ernie reading our name out there so, is uh. So let me let me ask you something, Billy, because I'm fascinated by your your history. I mean, you know, your family's got deep ties in the Franklin County, but you served you served all of us. You served our country. You protected us. You were over there. You mind talking about that, or is that? that uh, no, I don't mind. Uh, I mean, I, I, mean I want to thank you for your service and keeping us free. Oh, and you the can, funny you thing can thank is, George Bush for that. Well, but but for what you did, you know, what do you see differences? You know, not just where we live, but differences in the country that you fought for, like my dad fought for, into what it is actually right now. Um, my my best assessment of what's going on is essentially the inmates have taken over the asylum, and. We've gotten to a point in time where you're not allowed to fight through your problems. You're not allowed. You're, you're not allowed to fight that bully. Learn how to deal with things on your own. And we have created a very soft, soft, soft society. And we've got people out there now that that crave attention and dopamine rushes so much from just virtue and hate and vitriol that. It's it's almost become second nature. Then they've turned it into a religion. So it's. I think our darkest our darkest times are end up leading to the brightest lights. You know what I mean? I think the last couple of years, as dark and bad as they've been, I think it's really woke a lot of people up. Yeah. And you're not just seeing that through voting, like through Yunkin. You're also seeing that through even the short track renaissance. People are getting back to these short tracks because they're tired of corporate America shoving nonsense down. I don't want to tune into a game and find out, you know, who somebody sleeps with or who does this or who does that. That's not important. I want, I want an escape. And that's why people, I think, are just fed up with it. And I'm, I'm right along there with them. I'm just tired of being told how I should live by people who don't know how I live, by people in cities, right. by people in areas of this country that don't affect me. And I don't want them to live the way, you know, I decide. That This is for me. So it's it's been disheartening. But I always think that, that, that the, the difficult times always create strong men. So the pendulum is starting to swing back in the right direction. So. Where did you serve? I was in Iraq in 2003 for the invasion. And uh, God we, bless you. Thank I you appreciate it. Service. We went there with um, with an Appala- uh, a very hardcore Appalachian unit out of Gate City, Virginia. We all kind of collided with them, us out of Rocky Mountain, them. And we should have never been over there. Nobody knew why we were there. We weren't attached to anybody. When we got there, they said, what the hell are y'all doing here? So we kind of actually almost did our own thing. We were kind of out by ourselves. We lived in Mortar Alley by ourselves, so we didn't have to deal with the uh, the brass on post. And we were outside the wire every single day, um, doing escort missions, getting shot at, and, and, and things of that nature, staying busy. I don't think there's another – there is nobody else on the planet, aside from the guys in my platoon, that have more combat man miles than we do. Um, so we were outside the wire all the time. And it was, uh, it was something to behold. It really was. It was interesting. To say the least, I guess if there's, if there's a word you could use for war, I guess interesting would be the... And, and by the way, as we're speaking, if you hear a little noise in the background, we are at North Wilkesboro Speedway, just outside of Turn 3, and the Modifieds are on track practicing for tonight's race, so I think it's awesome. I love that sound. Sounds well, like victory. Sounds like America. And, and the senator had said something about what we thought about coming in here last night and again my, my mind was completely blown i did not under i did not expect this place to be sold out and have the energy and the fire that it did you know it kind of goes back to my first episode at a racetrack which was motor mile last year and this is kind of where a lot of the things for you all started and i remember we started that show Hermie saying my name is Hermie Sadler and i have no idea why i'm sitting here and uh here he is he still doesn't yeah. by the way <laughs> And, That's my go-to line. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to kind of talk to you all guys about that point in time because that was almost a turning point. You all had the Pesomatic guys there um, showing them the race. Senator, you were sponsoring that race. Herman, you were jumping back in the car. A lot of moving parts. I, I wasn't jumping. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long process getting in of that car. A, a half a gallon of Vaseline got yeah. in there. <laughs> They're actually talking about a, a new roof hatch for his next race. Yeah. You know, you know how they rescue horses in, like, California when there's a wildfire? With the helicopter, kind of, you know, with the with the harness. That's why we're going to drop him in there. That's how you'd have to get uh, Bodine in. And I, I, I got to say this. Shep wants to throw a funny in about me getting out of the car from the guy yesterday when Chad took a picture of us 
tape in our podcast, Shep says, don't use that picture because I look fat. <laughs> Did you make me look any fatter? Damn, yeah. Chad, shoulders up. Good boy, Chad. You're getting a raise. But you're right. We, we, and from, mileage. From where we started <laughs> back in October, you know, to here, a lot has happened. And, you know, we, quite frankly, use our podcast as a, as a platform. You know, we've got an ongoing lawsuit going on against we sued uh, then Governor Ralph Northam, Democratic Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Mark Herring to protect small businesses and their rights. And, you know, we decided to take this on, this, this fight, because really the people that really want to understand what we're doing, you know, the issue is about skill games. But the problem, really our lawsuit has nothing to do with skill games. It has to do with the government being able to, co- you know, come in and say, Billy, you can't have something, but Chad can because we say so. And it really just circumvents the the free market system and people's rights. And, you know, so we've taken on that fight. And so far we've been winning. And, uh, you know, Bill has put his legal career and legal uh, political clout, you know, on the line for, for, for a cause that he believes in. And But this our podcast and our race team is really – the platform that we continue to use to keep our message out front of people and so far it's worked great yeah and i mean you you if we don't get our message out here and that's why podcasts give you such an excellent platform that otherwise you don't have that nobody hears you and if nobody hears you nobody listens if nobody listens nobody knows if nobody knows nobody learns and what we have is a great opportunity and that's why you know it's inspirational to listen to you guys every week whether it's bluegrass music country western music racing just anybody an artist our whole culture that you bring out there i think is so very important so i try to turn on all my northern virginia friends to something like this so that they understand us a little better and maybe they can understand that we need to work together because actually we got it better than fairfax does they just don't know it they want to use our open fields to make solar farms so they can feel better when they go to bed because the magic electric genie only pumped solar electricity into their tesla oh Bodine and <laughs> and not the coal fired stuff and but but it's so important to get message out but also educate people on how important this part of the state is we you know in in politics we say there's nova northern virginia and then there's rova the rest of virginia now we exclude hampton roads and kind of the richmond that fer- they call it the fertile crescent there um, because there is a distinct separation but it is the differences that make us best but, but they're so blinded. They've got blinders on in the way that they, they get in their car, they commute for an hour and a half, they, they drink their coffee, they get to their office, they work, they come back, get in their car, same blinders, hour and a half home, and then they pull it in the garage, and that's their life. They don't see the fresh air. They don't see the glisten of the Blue Ridge Mountains as the sun is setting. They don't see people that really matter and care about real-life things. I mean, Jen and Hal... Senator Janet Howell, which is your friend, Hermie, she came down here one time and did a tour. And we encouraged her. She came to New College Institute. And I, and I saw her in the Senate chamber afterwards, and I said, how was your tour? And she said, oh, my God, the people are so friendly. And, you know, I was like, oh, great. You, you know, that's a surprise. That's normal. I said, what else? She goes, there's no traffic. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, what else? Well, that's about it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how they think. Everybody is cold to each other in Northern Virginia. You don't say hi to somebody walking in and out of a store. That's the problem. And if they don't see a different way, that's what they believe reality is. And you in Appalachia Podcast and us hopefully give them that different perspective and show them that there's more to life than what they see in their little manquarium. And that's what I hope. But you know, Senator, exactly what you're talking about. That's why it's <laughs> going to be so important. And that's why this 17th district election is going to just be crucial to the future of Virginia. It's so important that we have local representation up there. And hopefully we're going to be able to twist the arm and talk somebody in that's sitting relatively close to us and to uh, running for that seat. Well, we've said it a number of times. We're outnumbered. I mean, because geographic areas determine your district based on population, my district is huge. But in Northern Virginia, there's nine of them. In I mean, you know, in a 42 square block area, they drive. The funny thing is, they to drive from the west end to the east end of their district takes longer just because of traffic. Mine is distance based on miles. They have no perspective, and so we need loud voices 
whether it's in politics or whether it's on formats and, and platforms like this, we need those voices and we need to be heard so that they don't assign us an opinion. They ask it. I say this all the time, that people that I've encountered in Richmond, they're not all bad people, but they have a little bit of a disconnect between the policies they create and what goes into them and how those policies affect the normal, everyday working person. And does he realize if he doesn't speak, he doesn't get paid? <laughs> My name is Scott Minix, and I have no idea why I'm sitting here. Flashback. Yeah. He's, he's back. Yeah. He's back. Hermie. He'll DD me home tonight if he doesn't uh, start speaking up. Yeah, now. yeah. But you know, and that's really kind of what has encouraged me to to continue the fight and to get more involved and actually consider running for a a, a Senate seat in Virginia is, is simply because do I like politics? No. Do I? You know. But I, I care about the the state I live in and the country we live in. I have kids. I hope to have grandkids, you know, and I, I say all the time it I've never really got involved in politics in the past because we would slide a little bit one way back the other. But the train is so far off the track now that somebody has to stand up and, and like Bill's talking about and and let people know what life is like outside of the cocoons that the people in power across the Commonwealth live in. So it's very it's it. It's um, to me in a lot of ways. It's, it's now or never that somebody has to stand up and talk. You're about sounding that. the alarm. You have to. Somebody has to. Well, the Overton window has shifted so far that Obama from 15 years ago, if you just put his policies down a list right now and did not show a picture of him, the same people who vote on the left right now will consider him a far right extremist just based off of his and that's how far and that's what i really appreciate so much about y'all's podcast and that's why i'm glad that you all decided to do it to be able to get different ideas out there if you were to look at the senator right here from a distance like well he's just a politician with great you know, hair yeah with, with fantastic hair yeah. and he owns a race team so he's got to be super cool when he yeah. hangs out with Hermie. yeah but which is Probably, I, mean, I take that out on my taxes as a, <laughs> as a charity. All right? Makes it much more electable, you know? Yeah. But, you know, if you see him from a distance, you just think, okay, another normal politician. But I've had the chance to, to see him at a handful of races here and got to know him a little bit over the past year. And number one, between you all two, you all are very liberty-minded. You're not forcing your views down anybody else. You're saying, hey, what's fair for the voters? What's fair for the common person? You all are not extremely right-wing. If anything, you're about as moderate and middle as you could possibly be on most of these issues. And secondly, when you look at Senator Stanley, when you come to these racetracks, there is nobody that is more hospitable. And there is, and I've never met anybody that is more in tune with his guests and hoping and expecting them to have a really good time. And that's something very admirable that I'm, I'm glad you all do this show, and I want people to listen to understand that he's not just a, a suit and a face. He's somebody that when you come to the track and you're hanging out and you're having a good time with him, he genuinely wants everybody around to have a good time. He should have threw my crew out last night for eating all his barbecue five minutes in. <laughs> because he thinks you live in his district. <laughs> yeah, now, now he should not be confused. <laughs> but you know what? That's why I love you, Billy, because he came back with a replacement beer. Exactly. That was good. Well, they all drank his beer last night. Look, 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 we're all from the same place, and that's what's great about it. I mean, that, that really did matter to us. It matters to my wife, Laura, and myself and my family. I mean, you know, we're at home. We're, we're in a, another state. But we're in something that we all love and enjoy. And in a moment in history, I mean, Hermie said this to me last night. He looked at me and he said, there'll never be another moment like this. That our team won the first race back in North Wilkesboro. And the building block from that is not just important for all the short tracks in Virginia and North Carolina, South Carolina, as you said, that renaissance, but also the people that we spent it with, you guys. You know, uh, Randy Wilson, uh, who who's, I met through uh, Jonathan Brown, um, the Tomlinsons, everybody just, you know. <laughs> and look, we had Jeff Casey. Hammond on. Yeah, and Jeff uh, Hammond. Yeah, I saw Jeff come in here. Yeah. He came through here last night. Yeah, I believe. I mean, I'm sorry. And man, he gave such a great talk. I mean, yeah. just amazing, an amazing moment that can never be recreated, but we can make more amazing moments like that at short tracks all over Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, everywhere else. And, you know, you touched on something. Hermie always talks about that if he decides to run, he always talks about it's not what Hermie wants, it's what the people want. 
It's what his voters want to see happen. And, you know, he's if he decides to run, I think he'll have a very open mind, very liberty minded, as you mentioned. But I think he really has drilled down on something once again to realize that it's not about Hermie, it's about his constituents. You know, I, one of the things, and I, I joke about this with Senator Stanley, one of the reasons why I may not ever make it to a Senate seat is because I really don't care, no other than Bill, yeah. I don't really care what people in the General, General Assembly think about what I think. Right, you care about what he thinks you think too? Right. <laughs> but He's faking it. <laughs> you know, and so this there's this big thing when you start talking about running for office, the the people within the party, within the system, start talking to you about endorsements. You need to call so and so to endorse you. You need to call this person to endorse you. You need to call that person to endorse you. And I told the members of the caucus, Republican caucus, when I met with them, I said, I will never ever ask or call anybody politician big business leader or not and ask them to endorse me i will not do that if the right person comes along and and on their accord wants to endorse me or throw their support behind what i believe in in my cause and my mission that's fine but why am i going to pick up the phone and call somebody and say Hey, so and so, Mister Important Politician, so and so, would you endorse my campaign? No, I, I will, I will not do that because, as I told Shep, to me, what matters is what do the people that are going to be voting in the district that I may be trying to represent? What do they think? What are the issues they want me to 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 focus on? Not what some politician from another part of the state or somebody in Washington or somebody like that having their name behind mine and. Maybe maybe it'll hurt me, but I'm I'm I don't under you know I shouldn't have to a, a person that's doing it right shouldn't have to ever call or ask or beg somebody to endorse them, and I feel that way strongly. I'm endorsing you. <laughs> way well, too honest for I'll politics. Have, I'll have to decide <laughs> whether or not that, yeah. I'll have to decide whether or not I'm going to accept. <laughs> actually, that believe it or not, we're I, reviewing that endorsement. Well, actually, believe it or not, and this is the truth. And, and Brad Tuesday, Chad Monday knows this. So, you know, you get politicians that call, we'd really like your endorsement. And I always tell them, my endorsement is the kiss of death. Because if I endorse you, I mean, I have a losing record. And I don't think any any voter is actually going, oh, Bill Stanley. I'm not. <laughs> but it's just like one of those things. So I'd rather not. But, you know, I'll come out to your events. I'll, I'll support you, man. And, I'll, and, and if you get elected, especially General Assembly or even at local levels, man, I'm going to support you. Whatever I can do for you, you got it. Um, but I find them to be meaningless a lot of times. And, yeah. and quite frankly, I don't think Billy Riddle, you're going to look and say, go, oh, I got this cannon, I got this cannon. Uh, his endorsement this sucks. He's going to look at it and go, no, that's good. I mean, it's their own positions that matter. I always learn in politics, somebody taught me this a long time ago, when you have like two minutes to, to speak to somebody, you basically let them know who you are, what you stand for, and what you're going to do if you're elected for them. And for the people like, them. and that's where people are going to be convinced, not some endorsement. Well, we're so polarized here lately that nobody even wants to pay attention to the candidate for their views anymore. The only thing they want to look at is whether there's an R or a D beside their name, and they will vote for some of the most asinine things just just to try and make some point to somebody that doesn't even care. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's and that's where actually we had Jeff Ryer on. Um, for he's our comms director for caucus. He said it is more polarized than ever. So it's straight line ticketing. You know, you used to have, you used to vote for a guy, you could vote for Mark Warner and then the Republican. Now they're finding it's all straight line party votes. And we've just divided ourselves and we've divided ourselves based on party, rural versus urban. Uh, we're creating holes instead of creating, and instead of filling gaps and, and creating bonds. Uh, we're separating ourselves. And we see it even now with like uh, the abortion issue. You know. Every liberal's hair is on fire right now because they said, oh, abortion's now been made illegal by the Supreme Court. That's an absolute lie. It's now up to the states as the founding fathers intended, which is a state's right. Never put in the Constitution it needs to be a state issue. Well, there are going to be states that are going to limit. There are going to be states that outlaw. And there are going to be states that say right up to birth and after birth. If you got a problem, then those are the places you're going to live. But ultimately, that will create separation. maybe And, and not division, but, but only... 
only creating more that is already there. Uh, and I hope I live in a house in a in a state that is is recognizes the sanctity of life and, and is pro life. But we'll see. I'm 100 percent on board with that. And most of these people, as you say, they don't they don't really know the Constitution at all. They don't really understand how laws and things work. You know, people griping about the Supreme Court decision also want to gripe that there's too much power on the federal level, not understanding that the Supreme Court just relinquished that power. So they just want to be mad and they want to use it as a as a voting tool, most of the congressional members that are making the biggest fuss about this are, are in states that they just want to divide people. That, that abortion's not even going to change, like New York and California. Right. Why do you care? No, exactly. So, you know, I'm all pro life. You know, you you do have a choice. You have a choice whether you decide to engage in a sexual act or not. And beyond that, like everything else, I don't want to say getting pregnant is a consequence, but ultimately it, it is in, in the traditional sense. Hey. You, you don't need it, and that's my opinion. And and you know I'll stand by that. I think a life is a beautiful thing, and and um and and accountability and responsibility should, is what should be taught, not you know contra- contraception through abortion. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, those are human beings, but we could get into that, and we don't want to get too deep. Yeah, into that's that. a, that's a whole. But again, uh, the the United States Supreme Court is recognizing that states have rights because we are closest to the state in terms of the voter. The the voter reflects its own opinions through the people it elects in the state Senate and in the House of Delegates and in the governor's mansion. And that those are decisions best left to the people rather than a federal overarching government. And it gets us right back to the same thing we were talking about earlier. Do you want the government to have more power to dictate your life? Or do you want to be at a local level, the ability to control that, regulate uh, when it needs regulation, don't regulate when it's done, and ultimately let freedom ring? Let liberty prevail. And that's that's the question. Well, I hope it looks like people are finally starting to pay a little bit more attention as to what's going on. And we need to continue that momentum uh, into um, this November's elections. And hopefully people will continue to understand and realize that if you take a step back and not allow yourself to be brainwashed or 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 have a divisive view or to be closed-minded about somebody else's view if you sit there and just look at everything objectively then we need to really take a good hard look about where we are in the commonwealth of virginia as a whole and as we sit here talking about it if we open one person's eyes just to be open-minded and listen to really exactly what's going on and not feel like they have to take a specific side or the other then if we do that if we Get that message to one person, then it's been worth our time to sit here and talk about it. Yeah. Well, I think that's why you all are good vessels for it. You know, you both bring different perspectives when you're on your show. And, you know, Hermie, you come from a racing background, but uh, but you also facilitate the people in this country that move this country, and that's truck drivers. You have a handful of truck stops. I've stopped at them before as a truck driver myself. Um, best peanuts you can get in Virginia at some of them places. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I'm a peanut fanatic, so... So hey, you don't go really, to the bathroom because their their sinks will attack you. Yeah. But so you really have an understanding of what really moves America. Uh, you get around and you get to see these racetracks and speak with people in different parts of the country, and you know what it takes to keep the country moving for these truck drivers. And that's why I think you're an integral part. Well, the truck drivers moving products and produce, farmers that I personally sell fuel to that are being crushed by this inflation and other costs. And it's like you talk to certain people, they have no understanding of how much trouble we'll be in if trucks stop moving and farmers cannot afford the fertilizers and the and the things they need to produce a crop. You know, we, we, we say it jokingly, but it really isn't funny. It's like people in Northern Virginia and southern other areas of the state truly believe they grow produce at Food Lion in the back. Well, Hermie, yeah. they'll tell you they they just got to find another way to make money. Yeah, that's that's their solution. Well, yeah. it's the farmers are getting hit. Oh, it's they just got to find another way to make a living. Well, it doesn't work like that. Now, what do they what do they say? You've actually uh, been told that, I believe. Yeah, they're nine mils away from complete and total chaos in New York City and things like that. It's not it's not very far fetched, especially given the conditions we've seen in the past couple of years. So, you know, I think. Like I said, but between y'all two and the, the different angles and perspectives you all bring, um, I think I think it's a phenomenal combination. And I think both you all doing a, a phenomenal job in the state on a bunch of different angles, which kind of leads me. 
into the next few things we'll talk about before we get off of here. I want y'all to talk about just being owners and fans. Herman, you've won a lot of races in your time, a lot of big races. So put so compare that to how does last night level up to some of your biggest as an owner as a huge win at the, the reemergence of North Wilkesboro. I mean, this is historic. Right at the top of the list because this is, a, as we said earlier, that race last night that Ryan Newman won driving for Senator Stanley and I with pace matic on the car, everything that was hatched with a, with a dream we had and a conversation we had leading up to and through Motor Mile Speedway last year, we won a race that nobody else could ever win again. And a lot of things had to go right for that to happen. I mean, the, the team we put together, and the crew that we have with Phil Stefanelli and the guys. But, and I've told this to Bill several times, and, and, you know, I had, if anybody's lived the American dream, it's me. I got to, for 25-plus years, travel all over this country, either driving a race car or talking about it on national television. I mean, how lucky have I been? And I decided in 2019 that I didn't want to travel that much anymore, I wanted to devote more time to my to my family and my kids and all that. So this really gave me a a pipeline to, to do both. To to be back at home and look after my business, look after my family, do all these things, but to still scratch that itch a little bit every once in a while. But I say all that to say that after my twenty five years, the biggest asset that I have from my life on the road for twenty five years is my friendships and the relationships that I formed racing and doing TV following the NASCAR circus for 25 years. How is that important in this conversation? That I could pick up the phone and call Ryan Newman and say, do you want to drive a modified, you know, for a couple races, you know, and, you know, it's just been, not everybody could have done that. And Ryan, let's be honest. He has to have a lot of faith in Senator Stanley and I that when a guy like him, a legend, with all the races he's won and what he's accomplished, he has to have a lot of trust in us that we're going to put him in a car, a safe car that can be competitive and give him a chance to win. And he showed right up at Richmond earlier this year. We didn't get the finish we wanted, but we were fast enough to win. We had some bad luck. We come here and, you know, so – and just like yesterday, Shep and I walked inside the racetrack. And as soon as I walked across the track with my little handheld recorder, first person that hollers at me is Dale Earnhardt Jr. So we walk over there, and we start talking, and we talk for 15, 20 minutes on a piece that, you know, aired on our podcast. And it's like those relationships and friendships, and I've built, I've built trust with these people over the years. So to get back to your question, to see all that come together, um, I felt as satisfied or as rewarded last night as much as any race I ever personally won myself because I saw a smiles on lots of people's faces, like Senator Stanley, his wife, kids, oh, yeah. everybody. Because we created, we, created we created an opportunity that we capitalized on it. But the, the lesson behind all that is it didn't happen on, by accident. Every decision that goes into building those cars, the engines, the people, the driver, the decisions we made during practice yesterday, the decision we made during qualifying, for instance, for Ryan to only run one lap and to do all these other kind of things, everything we had a plan. And, you know, you don't win a race like we won here with Ryan Newman by accident. Everything, you have to have a plan and you have to execute it. But my relationship with Senator Stanley brought on pace matic the relationship with pace matic nurtured our relationship with Phil Stefanelli, then Jonathan Brown, then my long-term relationship with somebody like Ryan Newman allowed us to put the whole Yates thing Motors. together. Robert Yates built yeah. the engine, you know, Doug Yates. So there's a lot of things, um, but my most prized asset in my life it's these me. days, <laughs> outside of Bill Stanley, <laughs> Really and truly are the relationships I have with the, the, and the friendships I've built over 25 years of being on the road. And I'll tell you, I was fortunate enough to be down there with Hermie last night. I was on the wall, and I videotaped the 
coming around turn four, taking the checkered flag, and to see, I've known Hermie a lot of years, and to see the genuine excitement on his face. I mean, Hermie actually jumped up about three and a half inches off the pavement last night in elation. That's a hell of a vertical right there. But, you know, I mean, Hermie was, (laughs) he was high-fiving. He was hugging. He was smiling. It was a real uh, emotional reaction to, like you said, a plan coming full circle. And it was something just as a friend I was honored to be there to watch him come full circle with this. It, it was awesome. Hugely rewarding. I think, you know, the funny thing, ironically, for me is, so when we got together, of course, uh, friends a long time, we got pissed off the way that General Assembly handled skill games. He brought that attention. Uh, he brought that to my attention. We fought it. I just thought it was so unfair. We get together. He comes up with the idea of doing a podcast when we're doing the lawsuit. He's the one. I was the one that wanted the race team. He's the one of the one of the podcast, and yet his direction, his leadership, uh, especially and the relationships that he was just talking about, and the respect that he gets on the track, and uh, not only that, but also he said he looked at me and said, "We're not going to buy a car. We're going to build a car. We're not going to buy a team. We're going to build a team. We're not going to put some you know jack leg in the car. We're going to find the young driver to take us to the next level." And that deliberation, that, that, that love of the sport that you build it from the ground up, I mean, that's a testament to so many different things when you talk about small business or, or politics or grassroots. And we're going to make this something where, where we're going to educate people, we're going to advocate our positions, and, and we're going to give opportunities, and we're going to really, as he and I both had the passion for, that revival of the short track. He put that all together, and, uh, and he, has, he has leveraged that to where we've had great success. And in doing so very humbly, I hate to say that, but he's a humble guy. Uh, but again, for me, when I, when I caught up to him in, inside the track right before we went onto the elevator, um, I never had a bigger hug, never felt more proud, and, and, and just everything coming to fruition from one talk uh, with a colander and, and a pot and a mouse, <laughs> and here we are. Racing is the race team that we have. I run it just like I run every other aspect of every other business that I'm involved in. You find the best combination of talented people, put them in the right places, give them the resources, and manage, but not micromanage. And, you know, there's, look, we had the biggest turnaround. A a month ago, our car got demolished at Caraway. I mean, absolutely demolished. And our team was down. Our, our, our guys were questioning themselves. What are we doing? Are we doing things the right way? And the race before we won in Franklin. Yeah. I mean, wow. The, the roller coaster that we're on. But um, and I went to the race shop several times and, and tried to hit the reset button and get everybody back on the same page and kind of refocus everybody on the goal for, you know, for coming here and the things we were going to try to do to the cars and, you know, in, improve our engines and, and do – all the, and, and, and more importantly, we put together a plan, just like Bill does when, we, when we've been going to court to fight against the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know, Bill comes in with a plan, and we've been executing that plan. Same way with me. We, we started, Phil Stefanelli and I started a month ago. Once we kind of came up with a plan of coming to this racetrack, what we were going to need, because what you need to win at North Wilkesboro is different than what you need at just about any other track we go to. It's bigger. Um, the, the surface is is good, but it's old, and and the, the things you need, shock wise and grip wise and, and tire wise and all that. I mean, it's a different thing. We started putting together a plan of what to do at the shop to get here, but more importantly, it's hard when you come to the racetrack with a plan. It's hard to stick to the plan because always is. Yeah. You know, you say, "Well, I'm only going to make. We're only going to run five laps of practice." And, you know, you get here and you run five laps of practice and somebody else is a little bit faster than you are. And you say, well, let's make one more change and try it. But we stuck to the things that we wanted to try in practice and keeping the minimum amount of time on the car and the tires. And and our guys just executed. And as you saw, you put, I don't know if you guys saw that pass Ryan Newman made in lap traffic. Man. Oh, he yeah. Saw, he saw an opportunity and he pounced on it, but then got back out front and went right back to the plan, you know, and and made them chase him, come after him. And it was just a masterful driving job, which is not surprising. 
but you could just tell by Ryan. You know, Ryan's not the most outspoken guy, but once people started interviewing him about the meaning of winning at this racetrack with all the history and all the things, he started to, you know, to really start just letting it flow. And it was really cool to see. This is a big time win for he everybody knew, involved. He knew what a, he knew what had happened. Well, not only that though. I mean, Harmy, you've said you've noticed a real difference in him. Yeah. And an appreciative difference, and that's and and to see it then last night, and there's a clip that we've played of uh, him talking live to the Fox Channel down here in Wilkesboro, and you could just see. I mean, he was talking about his kids. He was talking about the Parsons family that he dedicated the win to. Very appreciative of us, mm-hmm. but you could see that joy, that love of racing, in the same way we see with Bobby Labonte. He's out here because he loves it, and that 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 really is. You're not coming out here. The, a lot of these guys are putting up their own money, missing you know days of work. They're doing it because they love the sport, and that's what we love being a part of it, and that's the best part really there. So we're, we're very excited. Well, I know when you were talking about, you know, filming Hermie last night, I did the same thing for Senator Stanley, and I was watching him, and I just wanted to be able to capture that moment of elation for somebody who's worked very, very hard, and same deal, hugging, jumping up and down, just enjoying life. And I also got, got to thinking that that was the second race that I had hung out with Senator Stanley at, and the second time that they had won. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe there's some, um, I don't know, maybe something that go Rabbit's through the house right. or the center or something. Maybe I could get a grant yeah. for being a lucky charm. Yeah, to we where, go. Yeah, you and Casey where, Tomlinson, you guys are <laughs> yeah. our good luck charms. Yeah. We're going to yeah. need that combination going forward so you know, we can and, run for a championship and smart. The, the thing, too, that we all forget in our daily lives sometimes, when you have success, you need to take a few moments along the way and enjoy them. Because life in general, but also racing, brings you more challenges. You lose more than you win. Yeah. And so if you let the lows get you too low and not not really take in and appreciate the moments you have success, then you, you're doing it wrong. So I'm glad we were able to, you know, now we re re rack them and go again tonight, um, you know, to, to, to try again. But last night was just really special. And I'm glad our whole team, you know, uh, Phil Stefanelli and Ryan Newman have been texting me pretty much all day, you know, uh, uh, about it, reminiscing about it and and talking about it. Well, and and having you guys here was really important to us as well. And and as we close here, I want to I just want to touch on uh, you guys are not only growing your podcast, but you're branching out into new podcast territory. Why don't we talk about that just for a little bit? Yeah. um, Well, after we got the Appalachian podcast started, we're trying to get our, our foot, and we finally realized that a, that a lot of people just like talking racing. They like hearing the stories. And and our racing doesn't focus so much on maybe the modern kind of stuff. A lot of our guests have been guys who, who blaze trails. You know, Jimmy Hensley, Satch Worley, Gerald Compton. Um, and we got Paul Rafford coming on Monday with Chris Williams. And that's going to be a phenomenal show. Guys like that. And we started realizing that racing really moved the needle. So... There are a couple other guys that I know that really enjoy the race, and we started a second podcast called D's Lug Nuts, something just a little bit different. What? D's Nuts? Ha! <laughs> Got <him. laughs> It's all right. That's a drop we do. So say it again. What is it? It's D's Lug Nuts. Um, you want to say the lug really these fast, nuts. so it kind of sounds like you're saying D's Nuts. But Got yeah, D's Lug Nuts. Um, I still laugh at that crap years later. We, yeah. So. We, we wanted... <sighs> Well, for one, we wanted to figure out how to get pit passes in the races, and that's a good way to start on top of the Appalachian <laughs> podcast. But, you know, based off of you guys kind of in the in the short track renaissance, you know, we've watched South Boston fill up a couple times this year. You know, we got to listen to Hermie call the Hampton Heat a couple weeks ago. Some of the modified races, short track racing is huge now. So we wanted to kind of find a way to get some of our audience that just like listening to the racing shows to come on over and just maybe do a weekly thing where we talk a little bit about – what happened in the NASCAR world to kind of tie it into the local area and then talk about some of the local tracks just because they need the, the exposure, you know, talk a little Bowman Gray, Franklin County, and whatever big is going on in Virginia just gives a little bit extra exposure. And it's fun and it's something different and, you know, gives, you know, Dean and Julian and Bodine a little chance to really, really open up their lungs and talk about racing because, you know, I'm more of the other things show i like racing and all of it then they're really focused well on everybody who's listening to this make sure you're tuning into that podcast as well uh hermy what a great podcast the appalachian podcast yeah they were our uh, start our, our appreciate y'all always being here supporting representing uh, you, you guys believe a lot of the same things we do and together we're reaching a lot of people i think we're making a difference and hopefully people are uh people are paying attention so uh we 
but every six months we need to reconnect and yeah and uh and get on together and and update each other on what's going on and you know trying to continue to to drive the message home yeah we're we're a band of brothers and 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 uh also tell everybody where they can listen to your great podcast the appalachian podcast yeah we're at uh, appalachianpodcast.org and that'll link you to pretty much all the the apps that are associated with us spotify apple you can also find us on facebook twitter and instagram all of those places um, and also the same with these lug nuts. It's D E E Z lug. Is that Brian? N U T Z. Yeah, Brian Dees, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's, so you can he find all those on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> things of that nature. Um, and I do once again appreciate you all. Uh, I'm down here today because of the senator. We showed up yesterday, just Love hoping, you, you know, we're gonna come down for one day, experience it, and then go back home. And and he looked at me and said, "Why don't you, why don't you come back tomorrow?" Yeah. Why, why don't you do this? And I, and I thought to myself, I sent my wife a message. I said, you know, I drive an 18-wheeler for a living. I said, I can go to work tomorrow and deliver, and I'm going to have the same result. Or I can come down here and try and just add on a little bit more to a legacy that I'm trying to build with some fantastic people and, and learn from people who really are successful and have have a path of success. So the more time I can hang out with you guys, the more I can pick your brain and the more I can apply it to what we do on a daily basis. So I certainly appreciate y'all's time and effort and getting to sit down and talk with y'all has been a phenomenal a- way to start Anything you want to add before you get off the air? Yeah, I mean, you've been Billy great. Billy covered it. Billy covered it. Thank you guys for having us. But you he still have no idea why you're here? He was supposed I'm here to watch you. <laughs> he was supposed to miss work yesterday just to come down and ride with me, and then we got back so late last night, and I had to tell my wife we're turning back around, that he ended up calling in work and, and skipping out again. He said, well, I'll ride back down with you if you want to. Absolutely. Come they see down. her and them damn supply pl- supply chain issues. <laughs> yeah. We're creating them. Hey, yeah. I tell you what. I think we have survived our first pod swap. Pod swap. And, and quite frankly, let's do it again, just like Hermie said. A great podcast, the Appalachian Podcast. You can find it on most major platforms and carriers. Listen to them, man. You'll learn so much about where we live and how, so much about what makes this area great. Uh, and, and listen to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. Together we come. Together we come for a purpose. Now we're going to shut this thing down and we're going to watch some great racing Absolutely. here at North Wilkesboro Absolutely. Speedway. Day two as the saga continues, the Wilkesboro tapes. Appreciate you guys coming out. Good Thank luck y'all to you. so much. Thanks for the hospitality. We'll see you next God time. God bless you guys. Ooh, I can piss the bad. I can taste Oh, it. I got a piss. Oh, leave that one on. Leave that one on. I've been holding on to that for 30 minutes right there. Oh. I'm going to turn it off. <laughs>